Father, we give our hearts to you. We worship you, God. We bless your name. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory because of who you are, God. So we worship you this morning. We thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your magnificence. We thank you for your splendor. We thank you for creating us even, God. So, oh, how we bless you, God. Oh, how we magnify your name. Oh, how we give you praise. As we go to your word, God, speak afresh. Teach us afresh. Open our eyes afresh, God, to be change agents, to be like you. And so we bless you, God. Felix dies. Felix moves out of the way. Speak through me, Lord, and you get the glory for everything that's going to be said and done. We give this all to you. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen and amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless your name. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm excited about God. I thank God for who he is. God is a wonderful God. God is an awesome God. Come on, give God a praise. Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen. Yeah. This is August, and um, I think football season starts pretty soon, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's got a game already? Is it? Is it already started? Yeah. The reason I bring that up is when your team scores a touchdown, I'm guaranteeing you're not going to be. You're going to get excited, all right? This is for God. This is for God. Come on, y'all. Yeah, this is for God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. This is for God. Amen. Yeah, God. Yeah, God. Yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Amen. So I'm messed up. I am messed up. I am messed up. I am messed up. Um, I, there's no other way to say it to you. I am, I am messed up. And the reason I'm messed up is um, I've been doing some work and spending some time studying on this series that we're going to begin today. And um, the more I dig into this thing, the more um, I am knowing who I am. You get where I'm going? And my goal is that you know who you are um, at the end of all of this and you don't believe the lie of the enemy. Are you with me? That's the bottom line because his goal is to not cause you or to enable you to find out who you are by telling you a lie. So I want to begin today. Um, today is just going to be a lot of uh, technical information. Uh, you know when I do these things and I begin... I try to always lay a theological foundation so we can find out what the Bible says or what God says about what we're going to be talking about. So today, we'll spend a lot of time dealing with this issue of identity, and we're going to walk through God's Word to hear what God is saying and what God is doing. So here's an opening statement that really has me messed up, and I am hoping this makes sense to you. Um, if it doesn't, I'll give you a little bit, bit of um, processing to help you understand this. So... Um, just let me read. It says here, and this is me speaking. Um, if it fits you, say it fits you, but this is me, right? What you see of me is my abnormal condition. While searching for identity, I realized I am created in God's image, yet conceived and born in sin. As an image bearer, sin is inevitable, but redemption is possible. My identity can be confusing but I know who I am. And I put the word there, I am human. Hopefully at the end of the series we'll be able to change that, okay? So lock into this real quick. I am an, I'm created in God's image, yet I am conceived and born in sin. And as an image bearer, sin is inevitable, but redemption is possible. My identity can be confusing. I think yours too. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Just a moment ago, you guys are all holy. Somebody makes you mad, the holiness goes away. Oh, come on, y'all. Can we be honest here? Your identity can be confusing because <laughs> it's not consistent. <laughs> you get where I'm going? <laughs> and so one moment you're all that, the next moment you're like, what in the world is going on in my life, right? Right? Somebody cut you off and you forgot you just came out of church. And you don't know who you are because you do things you ought not be doing. So it can be confusing. But the good news is um, 
Redemption is possible. Isn't that good news? Redemption is possible. Ah, and I know who I am. So today, um, I want to I wanna begin the series by talking about uh, the Imago Day. Uh, before we go all the places we're going to go, we're going to spend a lot of time going some places. Um, but I need you to commit to at least coming and listening. And if you're traveling elsewhere, make sure you log in online because we're going to land on some hard places. And the hard places we're going to land, if you don't have context, you're liable to disagree or you're liable to say, where in the world is this preacher coming from? So I need to walk you through this systematically. Can we do that? Just systematically. So today I'm just going to walk you through some pointers and, um, and get to where God is going. So whenever you heard the term Imago Day, come on, say Imago Day. I want to begin here by saying, I am made in the image of God. So repeat after me. Say, self, I am made in the image of God. Very important. One more time. Say, self, I am made in the image of God. Here's something critical that I learned this morning and I was sharing with our team this morning. Um, for the first time in my life, I'm learning what it really means to love people. Um, I really, for the first time in my life, and, and don't, don't walk out of here skewed and saying, you're the pastor, you should have always know how to love people. You don't know how to love people either. I think I'm comfortable saying that to you, right? You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, okay? And for the first time in my life, lo- listen to the terms I'm using, I am learning how to love people. Are you with me? Because the more I get a revelation of who I am and who God is, the more I am seeing my obligation to live like God and to be God in the earth realm, okay? I I can't remember one time in my entire life when God got so mad at me that he started yelling at me. Whew, I'm ready for this. So we're going to walk through this. I want us to walk through this because I'm learning that more and more and more. So, So, and I also learned that there's really when you search scripture, Adam and Eve pre sin. And then Jesus, post-sin, but being God incarnated, was the only three persons who ever walked the earth in the totality of the image of God. Everybody else was frail, flawed, sinless, messed up, confused. Come on, does this make sense? Everyone else had that problem. So only three somebody. So don't walk around saying, he must, the preacher missed me. No, I didn't miss you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there was only three. And so I want us to walk through that. So what I want to do this morning is I want to go through just to tell you what the image of God is to the best of my ability, give you some practical applications on how this plays out. And um, hopefully we'll be able to shape um, your theological framework. Next week I'm going to bring sin into the situation to, to let us know what sin is the impact sin has on us. The following week, I'm going to try to synthesize the two to show us where we find ourselves. And I'll make some statements along the way. Hopefully, you'll be able to track with me to see where God is going. So here's how I want to begin. I want to walk you through the Old Testament. So grab your Bibles real quick. I'm just going to read some scriptures. I'm going to talk. And all we're doing today is laying foundation for the depth that we're going to be going into. So in the Old Testament, I want to look at two passages of scripture. Um, Even though there's three on the screen and there's some other others that talks about the image of God, but I just want to walk you through this. Begin in Genesis chapter 1. So go to Genesis chapter 1, um, verse 26, and then we're going to move, we're going to move quickly and talk to this to hear uh, what God is saying and what God is doing. So here in Genesis chapter 1 and then verse 26, I want you to see something here and then we're going to walk through this to allow God to be God. Verse 26, if you're there, say amen. Here's what verse 26 says. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Look at verse 27. So God created man, how? In his own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. Now, don't miss verse 26. Verse 26, God is making a declaration, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then verse 27 says that God did what God said he was going to do. Very, very important. So what you see in those verses is that God created man and then he, and, and I don't even want to say, so, so let me be, start being clear here. I never said, nor did we read, that God placed his image in man. You guys all right with me? 
We are created in the image. Okay, so let me be clear up front. You're not walking around with the image of God in you. You are the image of God. Oh, my gosh. You ain't ready for this. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, I'm learning out of love. I'm not going to make it today. Um, because that's what we used to do, right? I, I, I have the image of God. And, and when we hear the term image bearer, we say, I'm a flesh person walking around with the image. Don't make that mistake, okay. He created you in his image. You are the image of God. I don't have time to go into the Hebrew definitions of the word image and likeness. We'll talk about that on Wednesday night. But very, very important. So number one, say, I am the image of God. Say it again. Say, I am the image of God. Now, this is going to really mess you up because I'm going to lay some foundation as we kind of walk through this. So one more time, say, I am the image of God. Go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, and I'm going to move really quick. Um, Genesis, was that, 9 and 6. Let me read this one thing real quick, and then we're going to walk you through this, and then we're going to go um, to some New Testament things. And I don't have time to deal with all the scriptures, but I'm going to talk about this. Look at what verse 6 says of chapter 9. Okay, you guys are there? This is after the flood, and um, God was giving man a fresh start again, so he entered into a covenant with Noah. And listen to what he says in verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. And look at it again, shed, thank you. For God made man, how? Wow, okay. So up front, killing is off the table, Right? Because you're killing individuals that are made in the image of God. Go to the New Testament. Let me just give you one. I'm just going to give you one in the New Testament because you don't have time. So write those down Wednesday. We'll be able to work through them. Go to, what do I want to deal with? James chapter 3. James chapter 3. This is a good one. This is a good one. Because um, this one uh, is very convicting. And then we're going to talk to James chapter 3, verse 9. James 3 and 9. Let's look at this one. Okay. You guys are there? Okay, here's what, just to give you context real quick, James is talking about the fact that no one can tame the, the tongue, right? And then verse 9, here's what he says about the tongue. With it, we bless our Lord and our Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Let me help you. Let me help because that sounds surfacey, right? Here's what the text says. This tongue, we're okay blessing God with it. But then we're also okay cursing the image of God with it. See how jacked up we are? <laughs> See how confused we are? With the tongue, right? So it says something about image bearers and what we ought not do with image bearers. So basically there's three views. I want to just give you three views as what we mean when we say the image of God. And I'm going to move quick because uh, we don't have time to dig depth. It, so I'll just give you some surface stuff. There's what's called a substantive view. And what that view says when you ask a person, what is the image of God? Or what does that mean? What does that look like? There's really three views. The first one says that the image of God consists of certain characteristics within every, um, the very nature of humankind, characteristics which may be physical, psychological, spiritual, and some theologians will argue that if I have the ability to reason, that is the image of God, or the, the ability to love, or to be able to, to show concern. Now, the substantive view says that the image of God then is something that's in us, okay? And these are people trying to interpret what the very image of God is. The second view kind of talks about what's known as the relational view. And what the relational view of the image of God says, the image of God is the ability within human to experience relationships. Number one, between ourselves and God and between each other, right? So here's what you might have heard this in your upbringing, that if you have the image of God, it means that you're able to relate with God and then you're also able to relate with other persons. These are attempts and listen to the words that I'm using, attempts to try to define the image of God. I like, I like this one. Um, the functional view of the image of God says the image of God is the ability to do um, or to experience or exercise dominion over the earth. Now, a lot of theologians land that the third or the functional view is what the image of God really is. And let me tell you why they say this. They say because when you look at Genesis 1 and 26, 
He created man in his image, and he gave man dominion. Now, I like that, and I'll talk about that in a little while, because here's what this means. Very, very important for you to hear me say this. There is nothing in the earth realm that should dominate you. Let me go here. Name one thing that can dominate God. No, you all supposed to say nothing. I am the image of God. So guess what exists that can dominate me? Oh, you're starting to get it. You're starting to get it. I know who I am. You're starting to get it, right? So then why? Well, let me not get ahead of myself, okay? Okay. So the, the, there's a the substantial view. There is the relational view. And then there's also known as what the functional view. Now, please understand with me, these are simply attempts to try to define what the image of God is. Let me give you um, some conclusions now as it relates to the image of God. And we're not going to be long this morning because I don't want to overwhelm you with information. The image of God is universal within the human race. Very, very important statement, okay? It is universal within the human race. Now, this is going to mess you up, okay? Um, because notice what the, um, the second statement says. The image of God has not been lost as a result of sin or specifically the fall. So here's what that means. The image of God is not only in church people. Come on, y'all. Uncle Bubba and them have the image regardless of how much he drinks. Y'all not hear me. Pookie and them. <laughs> y'all know Pookie. Regardless of how much you see him on that street corner selling drugs, the, he's an image bearer regardless of how bad he is. Y'all not hearing me. Your worst enemy, regardless of how much you can't stand them, has the image of God or is made in the image of God. It is universal. It is not just for Christian people. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. Okay, let me keep going because Genesis 1 and 26 still says he made man in his image. Number three, there is no indication that the image is present in one person to a greater degree than the other. This is heavy. Praying a whole lot does not grow the magnitude of the image. <laughs> Fasting doesn't grow the magnitude of the image, okay? So I'm going somewhere with this, right? So I've got the same amount. You've got the same amount. It doesn't matter where we are on the journey. We're all made in the image of God. Does that make sense? You guys are tracking with me. Let me keep going. Let me keep going here. So number three. So here's the thing. The image is not um, correlated with a variable. That means the image doesn't show up when I do something. It's present irrespective of what I do. You guys okay with that, right? So the image of God should be taught of primarily substantive or structural. This is very, very important. Look at the, the bottom thing. It says the image is something, um, the image is something in the very nature of humans, in the way in which we are made. It refers to something we are rather than something we have or do. So here's a bold, arrogant statement. I am the image of God. Point to yourself. Say, self, self. I, am I am the image of God. Image. One more time. Say, self, self. I, am I am the image of God. Let me correct this. You don't have it or you don't have to do nothing to get it. By virtue of the fact that you're born in the earth realm, you are a reflection or the image of God. You're made in his image and you're made in his likeness, okay? So don't fool yourself into thinking, man, I messed up, I sinned yesterday or I did this so I lost the image. Or I'm going to lay the image down so I can be me for a while. You cannot divorce yourself. It's the very essence of who you are. Oh my gosh, this is, this is just, this is just... This is, just, this is just something. Let's go here. So the image of God it refers to the elements in the makeup of human beings which enable us, lock into this, hear me, hear me, to fulfill your destiny. 
This is a shout just for me, for nobody else. I'll come back. The image is the powers of personality which, which make each human, watch into this, like God and being capable of acting with other persons, of thinking and reflecting and of willing freely. Um, willing freely. Back up number six. The image of God refers to the elements in the makeup of human beings which enable the fulfillment of their destiny. Here's what Jeremiah um, 1 says. Before I formed you in the womb, I what? I knew you. Okay? Listen to 29. It says this. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Okay? So lock into this. This is going to mess you up. So before the beginning began to be, God decided what he wanted each and every one of us on the face of earth to do. So almost as if God took a portion of himself and put it there and wrapped dirt around it and called it you. <laughs> Y'all not ready for that. So the only reason I exist, the only reason I am here is not to do what I want to do. It's not to do what I think I ought to do. It's not to be who I think I ought to be. It's, come on, come on. It's not for me to be who you called me to be. I am here only because God created me to fulfill his purpose. So God knows my destiny. <sighs> this, is a, this, is a, this is where this series is going to go. Lock into this. Hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. Don't fool yourself into thinking because you find yourself in a sin situation that you can convince me you were born that way. There is nothing sinful in God. And if God created you for his purpose, he did not make you sin. <sighs> we'll flesh it out. We'll flesh it out. Here's a summary. The image then is that set of qualities of God which reflected in humans make relationship and exercise of dominion possible. Here's what that says. Because I am the image of God, I can connect with God and I can do what God does in the earth realm. I am not saying that I am a God. Not saying that. That's Mormon theology. So this is what the Mormons will say, that when you die, you're going to go to heaven, get all the women you want, and rule the world. Some of the brothers are like, I'm going to be a Mormon right now. No, okay. <laughs> I am not saying that. I am saying God created me in the earth for the earth, and there's nothing in the earth that should dominate me. This is going to be freeing if you get it. Come on, say that. So let me give you some so what's. Okay, then we're going to get out of here because that's a lot to process. So, so what? What does all this mean? Number one, I, I should just, we belong to God. Regardless of whether the enemy has you or not, we belong to God. Here's what that passage, we don't have time to go to. Here's what Mark 12 said. The scribes and the Pharisees were trying to test Jesus. And so they said to him, and um, they brought this, they said to him, Lord, um, um, what was it about the coin? And should we, um, what should we do with this coin that we have? And Jesus said to them, bring the coin to me. And then he asked the question, who's, lock into this, who's, who's, let me give you the literal Greek word, whose image is on the coin? Right? And here's, they were trying to trick him. So whose image is on the coin? And they said, Caesar's image. Then here's what he says, then the coin belongs to Caesar. The unspoken in the text is whose image are you? Ah, then you belong to me. You kind of get it? We belong to God, okay? So that means we should pattern ourselves after Jesus, who is a complete revelation of what the image of God is. I wish we had time to go to Hebrews. Read these scriptures when you go home. Hebrews talks about Jesus being the very reflection and image of God, right? So I so appreciate now the little bracelet that would say WWJD. Y'all remember that back in the early days? What would Jesus do? When you, what you see Jesus doing is a reflection of how image bearers ought to behave themselves. That's what Hebrews said. 
okay? What we see Jesus do is how we ought to conduct ourselves. So look at number three. The only way we can fully experience humanity is when we are properly related to God. Meaning, when we go back to God again in right relationship with God, then we are living out what an image bearer really is all about. Let me go to some places. Let's keep going. There is goodness in learning to work. The exercise of dominion over our own personalities and abilities. And notice the parenthetic I have here. I said, we don't have to succumb to sin. We can exercise dominion. That's a very, very important statement. So listen to, this is what this says in English. God placed us in the earth and he says, have dominion over the heavens, over the earth, and over the sea. Okay? So a true image bearer ought not have addictive problems. Because we have dominion. A true image bearer ought not have marital problems. <laughs> because we have dominion. A true image bearer ought not have financial problems. <laughs> because we have yeah, you starting to get it. You get it, you get it, you get it, you get it. Nothing in the earth should have dominion over you because we are made in God's image. Listen to 1 and 26. Exercise dominion. The problem with me and the problem is you is that word exercise dominion. We let the thing dominate us and we don't rule over. Why? Because the devil's job, listen to this, is to swap your identity. That's his job. And when he can swap your identity and get you to live the lie, you surrender dominion power because you're not who you're supposed to be. And this person can't dominate nothing. Y'all don't believe me. Let me give you a quick example. In Genesis chapter 3. Um, Adam and Eve is living their true identity, full fellowship with God. Okay, lock into this. Then Satan comes on the scene to the form of the serpent, and he said to Eve, did God really say so on and so forth, so on and so forth? And then watch the switch, watch the switch. I know you're Eve, but I can make you better. You can be like God. Identity theft, we called it, right, John? And he fooled her into thinking that this identity is better than the identity God gave her. And she believed the lie and made the switch. And as soon as she swapped, she found out, that's not who I am. My problem and your problem is he came to me just like he did Eve and said, this is not who you are. This is who you can be. I believe the lie and I swapped. You believe the lie, and you swapped. Come on, come on, come on. In the case of mistaken identity, right? And we fool ourselves into thinking the lie is reality. So we see ourselves now, and we forget that we're depraved, messed up, sinful, whatever, as a result of sin, and we think this is the true us. It's not who you are. Does this make sense? I'm almost there. Human is valuable. The sacredness of human life is an extremely important principle in God's scheme of things. We already showed you that in murder is prohibited. Come on, say, don't kill nobody. Say it again, say, don't kill nobody. Now, why am I saying that? Because you're killing an image bearer. Very, very important. The animals were not made in the image, the birds were not made in the image, fish were not made in the image. You are made in the, the very essence of God. Okay, we're going to flesh this out. So the image, I'm, I'm done now. The image is universal in humankind, and it is found, I like that phrase, in all categories of people. You can't show me a human on the face of the earth that does not bear the image of God. Literally impossible to show me a human being that does not have the, hum the image of God. I don't care how bad they behaved. Now, here's some implications and then we're done. 
The universality of the image means that there is dignity to being human. Each individual is something beautiful, even though a distortion of what God originally intended humankind to be. That statement is teaching me how to love people. Let me tell you why. Because here's what I did in the past. I determined whether I liked you or not based on your behavior. Not who you were based on what God said. So you steal my car? Here's what I said. I don't like you. <laughs> right? Come on, is this making sense? And my relationship with you was predicated on your behavior, not the creation of God. Oh, don't act like you didn't do it either. I'm going to say some hard things. I'm going to say some hard things. And we treat each other in the earth realm based on what we see versus what God created. Or better stated, based on how, so you wronged me, you treat me wrong, you did stuff. Here's what I'm, I'm going to spend the majority of my life fighting you to get you to make it right. And I will treat you that way based on what you did. When... If you and I are completely equal and there is nothing you can do to cause God to fight you back, or better stated, to defend himself against you, why are we doing it? Oh, my gosh, you're ready for this. <sighs> The universality of the image also means that persons have points of sensitivity to spiritual things. This is important. Because I'm made in the image, by default, I'm going to pursue my maker. So here's what it looks like. Everybody says there's a higher power. So the Muslims, they pursue Allah. You kind of get what I'm saying? Everybody's pursuing something above them because they know they're not the end of it all. We pursue God, right? So you remember Paul in the Acts when he went to, what's it, Athens? And they had all these temples made up to, and they had one to the unknown God. And he says, let me tell you about this unknown God. That's the one that transcends all these others. You kind of get it? So God wants us to teach the world. Here is a couple of hard things and then we'll be done. Freedom then must not be taken from a human who has not forfeited that right. So the image means slavery is improper. Because we're all image bearer, right? Racism is improper. Because we're all, you kind of get what I'm saying? I, I, I don't know if our fathers, forefathers understood the theology of the image of God, but we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men or humans are what? Cre created how? We all have the what? You get it, you get it, you get it. Abortion is wrong. Because I am killing. <laughs> can, we, can we keep going? You kind of get what I'm saying? On and on and on and on and on. I know some of y'all don't want to hear this, but when I, look at, when I look at that, I can't help but conclude that all lives... So I don't fight from a posture of race. I fight from a posture of image. I don't care whether you black, white, pink, yellow, orange, polka dot, whatever. Don't kill. Don't enslave. Don't, you kind of get where I'm going? You kind of get where I'm going? You get this, right? So that means, that, that means, that means, let me read this and then I'll be done. Then we're going to pray. Um, here, here's what that means. Um, that what you see of me is my abnormal condition. While searching for identity, I realize I'm created in God's image, yet I am conceived and born in sin. So as an image bearer, sin is inevitable, but redemption is possible. My identity, I, my identity can be confusing, but I know who I am, okay? And I add the term, I am human. So lock into this. Spiritually, when God creates me, he makes me an image bearer. Now lock into this. This is where we're going to pick up next week. 
the moment I enter the world, I don't forfeit my image-bearing tendencies, but I am now born into sin. Right? If I don't realize that I'm an image-bearer before I am a sinner, guess what I'm going to do? Sin. Yeah. So here's what it looks like. You got people defining themselves by how they were born into versus how God. Because lock into this. Birth does not happen if creation is not spoken. You can't be born if God didn't create you. So don't tell me how you were born or what's happening while you're born. Talk to me about creation and image bearing. Does this make sense? So I'm telling you, here's how this is messing me up. Our interpersonal relationship is going to be a lot different, a lot stronger. My interaction with Katani, my kids, this church family, the community, all that stuff. I have to be the God representative in the community. Oh, my gosh. I've got to love the unlovable. Oh, y'all not hearing me. I've, <laughs> come on, y'all. I've got to care for folk who despitefully use me and abuse me. Come on. I have to stand for what God says because my obligation is to be God in the world so that when they look at me, they don't see me, but they see what? The Christ in me, which is the hope of glory. And that's what God wants us to see. But no, here's what we do. We fight for everything from a posture of sin. Mess it up every single time. I thank God that he didn't fight for me from a posture of sin. Does this make sense, guys? Say, I am made in the image of God. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, we thank you for you. We have a long road to travel, God. But it's important, number one, that we understand who we are. Made in your image. What we see is not necessarily your creation until alignment takes place. Forgive us for living the lie, God. Forgive us for fooling ourselves into thinking that we know better, better when we should be checking with you. So Holy Spirit, thank you for your word. Teach us to love like you. Teach us to crucify the flesh. Teach us to walk like you walk and be who you would have us to be. We give ourselves to you, God. We're knowing who we are. We're finding out it's being revealed to us day by day. So thank you for you, God. Thank you for you.